on this Friday night, remembering the man behind the brand. It was always that part of him that grounded him, so he really felt he was obliged to give back, and he did. How Ron Joyce made Tim Hortons an iconic Canadian experience. Why so many associate his name with donations, not donuts. The United States will continue to do what is best for our people and those of our allies. Cutting loose from a nuclear arms treaty with Russia, what it means for peace and security everywhere. This is an opportunity for an artist to really make a splash. And the NFL fumbles towards Super Bowl Sunday. Will controversy over the halftime show eclipse the game itself? Our pop panel will lay it all out. This is The National. In the dangerous world of the Cold War, the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty was considered a gold standard. Its verification and inspection regimes, a blueprint for curbing weaponized ambitions. Now it's all but dead, the U.S. announcing it's pulling out. The INF Treaty covers land-based missiles with a range of 500 to 5,500 kilometers. The U.S. and Soviet Russia dismantled hundreds in the last years of the Cold War. But as Keith Bogue reports, that was then. The worry now is the threat of a new arms race. The United States will therefore suspend its obligations under the INF Treaty, effective February 2nd. And so begins the drawing back of a curtain across an era of nuclear weapons reduction that dates back to President Ronald Reagan in 1987. We have listened to the wisdom of, in an old Russian maxim. This was the moment Reagan immortalized the spirit of nuclear weapons agreements then and for the future. The maxim is dovayai no provayai, trust but verify. <laughs> <laughs> you repeat that at every meeting. <laughs> More than 30 years later, with a Russian president who seems to see nuclear weapons as the last pillars of his country's consequence as a power, the essential trust Reagan spoke of has broken down. Unless we're going to have something that we all agree to, we can't be put at the disadvantage of going by a treaty, limiting what we do when somebody else doesn't go by that treaty. For the last five years, Russia has repeatedly denied that it's deployed a type of missile near European borders that operates within a range of distance that is specifically prohibited by the treaty it signed in 1987. But the U.S. and its NATO allies have verified that's what it does. When it comes to any type of treaty obligations, um, especially when it comes to non-proliferation and disarmament, it requires all parties to live up to their obli obligations, and Russia has not. Canada supports the U.S. decision to pull out of the treaty, but in the hope that there is still time for Russia to comply with it. That's not necessarily the way to deal with Russia. I agree. They are almost certainly in violation. But when someone breaks the law, you don't repeal the law. The trick is to get them back into compliance. That hasn't worked for the last five years, and so the chance it will work in the next six months is not particularly high. Keith Bogue, CBC News, Washington. And as Keith mentioned, Russia has always denied that it violated the INF Treaty. Chris Brown has the reaction in Moscow, where concern is mixed with outrage. Well, the Russians have been preparing for this day, for this announcement from the U.S. for weeks, if not months, and today they were ready with some fairly intense pushback. Some of the strongest quotes came from the Federation Council Committee on Foreign Affairs. The U.S. has taken another step towards destroying the world said its chairman, and from the head of the Duma, a prominent deputy, Leonid Slutsky, the United States has triggered another arms race. The Russians have tried to get their ducks in order on this, saying that they're not the ones that want to get out of this treaty. They invited a group of defense attaches to come out to a Patriot Park to actually inspect some of these controversial weapons and said, look, we know and they, we will show you they can only fly 480 kilometers, therefore they do not violate this treaty. NATO officials, however, were not convinced. Afterwards, the U.S. issued a statement saying essentially uh, uh, that the Russian claims were a lie. Russian state TV talk shows today were also going full throttle. There have been a number of calls we heard for the Russians to immediately begin developing a new range of, uh, of intermediate weapons. But along with the anger, also clearly some worry. Some panelists said that with the shorter 
um, weapons in play, the ranges and the reaction time to launch counterstrikes also lessens meanings, meaning it won't be, for example, the president or the top general uh, saying fire. It could be a much lower level field commander, uh, a very worrying thought to many. Chris Brown, CBC News, Moscow. So what does the end of this treaty mean? We reached out to a nuclear policy expert to answer some key questions. In spite of its name, the treaty prohibits both uh, nuclear and conventional missiles. NATO's challenge in Europe uh, is defending the Baltic states, uh, which are um, exposed on the far eastern part of Europe. Uh, that task would be a lot harder uh, if Russia has this ability to reach deep into Europe with non-nuclear weapons. Because I think the US government doesn't want this treaty any longer. Uh, Russia violated that treaty, but I think that is, has become a useful excuse for this particular administration to get out of a treaty. The big driver within parts of the administration is to deploy missiles in Asia against China. China has a lot of missiles within the range limits prohibited by the INF. INF is an important treaty. There is an even more important treaty here, which is New START. It's the one that controls the longest range, the strategic forces uh, possessed by each side. Uh, and I think the demise of INF makes the demise of New START much more likely. Uh, I'm very worried that uh, New START is not going to be extended or replaced. Uh, and that in the not too distant future, we could be left without any arms control infrastructure between the US and Russia. Uh, and I find that a very worrying prospect. And the New START Treaty expires in 2021. It can be extended for five years, but only if negotiations to renew it begin soon and succeed. Well, now turning to this country, the self made man who took Tim Hortons from local coffee chain to Canadian mega brand has died. Ron Joyce's name may not be on the signs, but his relentless drive is why there are so many of them. Can you imagine buying a Tim Horton franchise from a, a hockey player and a dumb cop? By his own admission, Joyce knew nothing about the food business when he met the former Toronto Maple Leaf in the 1960s. But he scraped some money together and dove in. Originally as Horton's first franchisee, but before long, in his words, he was running the show. On average, 1,500 people come in here every day. When Tim Horton died in a car crash in 1974, Joyce took sole control of the business, leading its rapid growth, though not without some controversy, including legal battles with Horton's widow, Lori. But business boomed as Joyce honed the key to Tim's success, an inextricable link to Canadian identity, from the folksy branding, value for the dollar, and close ties to hockey. Few things say Canada more than Tim Hortons. Tim Hortons, can I take your order, please? It's freaking mighty chilly. It's a good thing I went to Tim Hortons and I got myself a, a large double-double just to take off that breeze, right? You know. Oh, jeez. Even the people who aren't from Canada. Oh, this coffee is excellent. <laughs> After selling the business in the mid-90s, he stayed active, opening an air charter company in Hamilton and a luxury golf resort near his childhood home in Nova Scotia. Selling control of the company to U.S.-based Wendy's International in the 90s made Joyce a billionaire, even though he later said it was the life's, uh, his life's biggest regret. And the journalist who co-wrote Joyce's book says his attachment for Tim's never died. I think Ron quite publicly has had his spats with Tim Hortons over the last 10 or 15 years. Um, from the point where he stepped away from the board of Wendy's, which owned Tim's at the time, um, he had an attachment to the brand and to the people who operated the original stores, which went beyond business. It was personal loyalty, and I think when the brand started to change, he grew increasingly uncomfortable with some of the direction it was taking, and he could occasionally just show up in the media to somebody to ask him the question, and he'd espouse his opinion, and he was never short on opinions. One part of Joyce's legacy that can't be ignored is his philanthropy. From kids' camps to hospitals to universities, he changed people's lives across the country. The CBC's Brett Ruskin spoke to some of them. So he believed if he was lucky enough 
to be as successful he was, he was going to give it back. This rehabilitation centre is used every day by kids from across the Maritimes. It's located here at the IWK Health Centre, one of the many organisations where Ron Joyce would show up, big check in hand, and offer support. He was going to donate a million and then he saw a child being wheeled in to be operated on and it just touched his heart and he actually said, I'll double it. And he did the all double double of all time. He gave us two million. I was going to build a causeway, but he's... Joyce did enjoy a lavish lifestyle. Fancy cars, big homes and private jets. But he also shared the wealth. One day each year, all of the proceeds from coffee sold across the country would go to help send underprivileged kids to one of the many Tim Hortons camps that dotted the Canadian landscape. That's a rod for when you can only use one rod. Speaking to CBC News in 2006, he said giving back was always part of the Tim Hortons corporate identity. Because that really is the secret of this, the success of this company. It's in community involvement. It's it's putting kids in soccer clothes, hockey teams, baseball teams, taking kids to camp, being caring about the community. And I think that's one of the reasons why it's become such a great Canadian icon. Aisha Gatouche is a computer science student at Dalhousie University. She received a scholarship from the Joyce Family Foundation. I think people like this, like it's amazing how much of an effect you can have on someone's life without knowing them personally. And I think Someone like that should be celebrated and remembered for all the great things that they did. Ron Joyce's life changed over the years as his company grew, but he never forgot where he came from. It was always that part of him that grounded him, so he really felt he was obliged to give back, and he did. Brett Ruskin, CBC News, Halifax. 88-year-old Ron Joyce died at home surrounded by family in Burlington, Ontario, not far from that first Tim Hortons that he bought more than five decades ago. Well, you'll see people doing this on street corners, at bus stops, outside most office buildings. There's no question vaping is on the rise, but it's increasingly popular among one particular group, teenagers. And now there's a new warning for young people that smoking e-cigarettes could lead to the real thing. According to a new study in the Journal of the American Medical Association, in a group of teens who swore they wouldn't use cigarettes, the ones who tried vaping were eight times more likely to become cigarette smokers. Christine Birak looks at the dangerous draw of vaping and the risk to Canadian teens. Kids who never would have bought a pack of cigarettes, let alone smoked marijuana, are now vaping. I have some friends that never smoked before and now they vape because it's the cool thing. And then when we go out, sometimes they'll have a cigarette now when before they never would. A study published today on the relationship between e-cigarette use and tobacco cigarettes backs up what others have been warning. Researchers found kids who experiment with vaping are much more likely to try smoking regular cigarettes. And that's a serious problem because e-cigarettes are already popular. Sometimes it's kind of uncomfortable to go in the bathroom while the kids are vaping and stuff. Public health experts say kids understand the dangers of smoking, but they don't know much about vaping, aside from ads and word of mouth. They see this as something that everybody does. Maybe it's not as bad as people are saying it is. Maybe, you know, again, it's that sort of normalization of the process that really drives people into maybe disregarding some of the health risks or maybe not paying as close attention as they should. How many people see it in our elementary school? Definitely. Okay, to eight. At a gathering of teachers and educators in Toronto, vaping is a serious subject. It's not seen as dangerous. While many were busy talking about marijuana, e-cigarettes quietly snuck into schools. You can't detect it as a teacher or a parent, and it's done at the back of buses. The nicotine in e-cigarettes can harm a developing brain and cause addiction. As well, inhaling vape chemicals can lead to breathing problems. Educators say they need to stress the dangers to kids and their parents immediately. This is preventable, um, and I think if we jump on it right now, uh, hopefully it won't be a crisis in 30 years. Health Canada says it's rolling out an awareness campaign and still reviewing all the data on whether vaping can be a gateway to smoking. I guess we're the guinea pigs of the future. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. Vaping is big business and it is getting bigger. E-cigarette manufacturer Juul collected $1 billion in revenue in 2018 compared to just $200 million in 2017, a five-fold increase in just a year. 
It's partly owned by the same company that makes Marlboro cigarettes. In Quebec today, the Premier François Legault addressed a controversy over his comments on Islamophobia, specifically his view that Quebec doesn't need a day devoted to combating it. Legault also rejected the idea last year, when his CAQ party was still in opposition, as did the then Liberal government. As Alison Northcott tells us, some Quebec Muslims say they're simply not being heard. It's Friday prayers at this downtown Montreal mosque. Ahmed Badr says that just because he doesn't experience Islamophobia every day doesn't mean it isn't there. I see a difference when I walk alone, when I shop alone, and when I walk with my wife who wear hijab. Like, there is a difference. What is that difference? Sometimes people react like giving you like a sort of Angry luck. Quebec Premier François Legault has become the centre of controversy around the question of Islamophobia in the province after saying this when asked if there should be a day dedicated to fighting the issue. Je pense pas qu'il y ait de l'islamophobie au Québec, donc euh, je vois pas pourquoi il y aurait euh, une journée euh, consacrée à l'islamophobie. His comments come just days after the anniversary of the deadly Quebec City mosque shooting. This kind of um, of, of of speech is very dangerous of our children. Uh, we, we need to educate the future generation uh, to accept these differences. And uh, we need to recognize there is a problem. The Premier tried to clarify his position today through a spokesperson saying Legault meant to say there is no undercurrent of Islamophobia in Quebec and that Islamophobia does exist, but that Quebec is not Islamophobic or racist. We are not necessarily worse than other places. Maybe even Quebec is better than other places. Nevertheless, it's not because my health is better than my neighbour. When I'm sick, I don't go to see the doctor. We have a problem. He points to the arrest just yesterday of a Quebec man who faces a charge of inciting hatred for his comments about Muslims. While Legault's earlier comments left some, like Amin Salah, feeling let down. I feel not respected, actually. That's what I feel. The National Council of Canadian Muslims says it welcomes the Premier's clarification, calling it a good first step towards a broader conversation about what the province can do to address the problem. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. Some other stories we're following tonight. It's Alberta's turn for plunging temperatures as the extreme weather heads west. It's expected to reach close to minus 30 this weekend and only slightly warmer than that during the day. And some regions north of Calgary will also see as much as 50 centimeters of snow. Even Vancouver is in for snow flurries on Sunday. I haven't seen anything like this. There was lorries uh, jackknifed all up this road. There's lorries jackknifed. Um, there's vehicles everywhere. In England, drivers were forced to abandon their cars as close to 20 centimetres of snow fell across the southern part of the country. A warning was issued for treacherous driving conditions today and two airports closed their runways. More snow is forecast for tonight. In the southern hemisphere, fires started by lightning strikes are raging in the Australian state of Tasmania. Hot, dry conditions have caused the destruction of almost 200,000 hectares, and hundreds of people have been forced from their homes. This week is typically the country's peak fire season, and there is no significant rain in the forecast. Ahead tonight on The National, they didn't know him, but that didn't matter. Hundreds of strangers answer a call for help to lay a Holocaust survivor to rest. And we'll look at a new approach to life with dementia, why some seniors' homes are embracing risks in aid of a happier life. First, though, Rihanna said no. Cardi B took a pass. The controversy over this year's Super Bowl halftime show. I said no to the Super Bowl. You need me, I don't need you. They're turning down like 100 million pairs of eyes. Super Bowl is losing its appeal as a, a vehicle for exposure. I'm not in the right profession if I can't handle a little bit of controversy. Um, it's what it is. We expected it. We'd like to move on from it. Maroon 5 frontman Adam Levine responding this week to the group's decision to say yes to the NFL. On Sunday, the band will take to one of music's biggest stages, the halftime show of Sunday's Super Bowl.
Over the years, it's been a coveted gig, but this year the NFL had to go begging for performers. The CBC's Tashana Reed explains why. For Super Bowl 53, the halftime show has been a tough sell, mainly because of this man, Colin Kaepernick. Believe in something, even if it means sacrificing everything. The former quarterback, now in a legal battle with the NFL, led a wave of protests by kneeling during the national anthem to draw attention to police brutality on African Americans. Now musicians are protesting for him. Before Maroon 5, Big Boy and Travis Scott said yes to halftime, a list of high-profile acts said no. Rihanna reportedly was the NFL's first pick, but turned it down in support of Kaepernick. Then rap it girl Cardi B said no. Jay-Z even rapped about his refusal. I said no to the Super Bowl. You need me, I don't need you. Famed Atlanta music producer Jermaine Dupri, who has worked with the likes of Mariah Carey, partnered with the NFL on a series of free concerts in the city leading up to the big event. This is a celebration of this city, and if you're from this city, I feel like it's hard for you not to celebrate in your own city. After the backlash, Dupree offered families affected by police brutality a platform to speak at his concerts. At the same time, um, acknowledging the situation and acknowledging why it's a protest and what's going on, um, I definitely did that as well. Music writer Travis Yo Phillips says the NFL may not want the politics of hip hop, but they need the audience it brings with it. For the NFL to have a halftime show that has draw, that has viewership, to get the young audience and the old audience, you need to inquire about some of the biggest artists in rap. The pros of performing on the world's biggest stage are immeasurable. Free promotion, boosts in album sales and streams. For artists to say no signals a major shift, says this music business expert. They're turning down like 100 million pairs of eyes. Super Bowl is losing its appeal as a, a vehicle for exposure. Michael. But halftime isn't just about music or politics. It's about advertising. A 30-second commercial spot costs $5 million. The halftime show is that thing, that event that brings everyone into the room, which is why, why is the advertising the most expensive during halftime show? Which means the NFL has to deliver on viewers. That pressure to win over a divided audience now rests on the performers. Tashana Reed, CBC News, Toronto. So no shortage of controversy ahead of the Super Bowl and no shortage of topics for the pop panel to tackle. Andrew will be here with them right after the break. And a little later, David Common takes us inside a senior's home with a different approach to life with dementia. But it doesn't come without risk. In some homes, they would just say, if you're at risk of falling. Yes. Oh, no, we let our residents live at risk. What does that mean, live at risk? Let them lead their life according to how they want to live. Like, we can't save them from injury, you know, but at least they're living their life. And being... It's nearly Super Bowl Sunday, but the Rams and the Patriots aren't the only ones going head to head. It's a tough time to be a football fan. I grew up loving and playing the game. Now it's much more of a love-hate relationship. After Colin Kaepernick was basically blacklisted from the NFL for taking a knee during the national anthem, the league and its famous halftime show are now under fire. I'm Katie Underwood, Toronto writer and editor. I'm Ashani Nath, senior editor at Flair.com. I'm Donovan Bennett, host and staff writer for Sportsnet. Being picked to perform at the Super Bowl halftime show used to be a coveted rite of passage for musical acts. It used to be a sign that they were on their way to icon status. Prince, Beyonce, Michael Jackson, Lady Gaga, the Rolling Stones, icons. Instead, this year, we're getting Maroon 5. And they're getting skewered for taking the gig. Some people say we should just put politics aside and just enjoy the game. But that halftime stage is one of the most watched television events of the year. And in this day and age, that makes it a political platform, whether you like it or not. Donovan, 
this is your wheelhouse. So we're, we're going to start with you. And, and you know, football's tough. Politics, though, that's a blood sport. And, and now we actually have a political football, right? Yeah, I mean, context matters. If we go back to 2016 when Kaepernick kneeled, it became a political football for Donald Trump. It's something he spoke to his base about. And ever since, the NFL not really being in line with the players, forcing them not to protest, putting in rules around when they could protest. It was seen, you're either on one side, you're with the players, you're pro-social activism, or you're with Trump and the NFL. And what has happened since? NFL coaches, as far as African Americans, the number has gone down. We have still never had a musical act that was a hip hop act. So this is not just about people feeling like Rune 5 is the official band of soccer moms everywhere. It's that it's another area where Colin Kaepernick and people who look like them weren't given a real platform. As a football fan, I mean, how do you, how do you just feel that, that it's become as political as it has? Yeah, it's, 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 it's tough because as much as you want to just enjoy the game, you know that everything around the game now is political. And, including the halftime act, which was supposed to be the thing that everyone, whether you like football or not, was interested in. Um, and I, I feel like, once again, the NFL has gotten this so, so wrong. Katie, uh, we're going to talk about the NFL in just a second, but, but Katie, I mean, Maroon 5's perspective, right? This was yeah. both the gig that they couldn't possibly pass up mm -hmm. and, and the gig that they couldn't possibly take, when mm -hmm. you think about it. Is, it. is it fair to fault them for taking it? Uh, Yes, I think it is because they did take it. So it, it does merit criticism. When, the, when you make a choice to align yourself in, with an organization that has historically put profit over you know, progressive social politics, I think you have to reasonably expect some criticism for that. I don't think anyone is saying Maroon 5 is the problem. Maroon 5 is the root of this you know, hairy discourse around race relations in the States. No one's expecting that much from Adam Levine, I think I'm going to be honest, in terms of wokeness. But I think you know you have to look at the power differential here and the, what the losses that are incurred from speaking out. Maroon Five loses nothing from not taking this gig. I mean, it would be a nice thing for you know their personal CVs, I guess. But essentially, after this is over, they could say, you know what, we're not doing it. We'll go back to Malibu to our Victoria's Secret wives. Like we don't really lose anything other than you know some Instagram followers. But, but in your mind, an appearance at the halftime show is tantamount to what an endorsement of the NFL's policies? In this climate, it absolutely is. And I think you know, Colin. Kaepernick, on the other hand, he lost his job for speaking out about his his views. And for him, it's, you know, a literal life or death issue. He's a black man in America. So I think, you know, you can't fault Maroon 5 for the entirety of the situation, but I think they need to expect some blowback, but for sure. Ishani, you know, one of the band members from Maroon 5 mm -hmm. came out, and I should add that it, he's the one black member of mm -hmm. Maroon 5, so PJ Morton, and he said in his statement that Maroon 5 can play for the NFL, Players can play for the NFL, and we can all support Colin Kaepernick at the same time. Can they? I think no matter what they do, it's going to be sending a message. If they incorporate some kind of messaging, like uh, when U2 took the stage after 9-11, they had a huge message of inclusivity. They had the names of all the victims of 9-11 playing on a screen behind them. It was a political platform. So I think Maroon 5 has a chance to do something with their performance to recognize what's going on. But I am curious to see what happens on Sunday, um, because either way, it's going to send a message to the people watching. And you go back to the decision to, to enlist Maroon 5 in the first place. I mean, why, why choose Maroon 5 in one of the blackest cities in the entire United States during a year in which the treatment of black people is as hot button an issue as it is? For me, they should have just owned it and made it like an ode to Atlanta with all hip-hop artists. But you run the risk of some of them surprising you, maybe not the way Justin Timberlake surprised us <laughs> in years past, but surprising yeah. you with an ode to Kaepernick. And I, I do think, though, that uh, this is an opportunity for an artist to really make a splash. We know that streams and downloads go up after the performance. These performances are more viewed than the actual highlights of the game on YouTube afterwards. And I think the NFL was afraid that if there was a social statement, people would be even more so talking about Kaepernick as the quarterback around the Super Bowl and not Tom Brady, who's been there now for the ninth time. <laughs> but the, I, I mean, I guess the bigger picture, though, that we all have to keep in mind is, you know, the backdrop to all of this is the NFL's flagging numbers, right? So mm -hmm. if you look at, at last year's Super Bowl, for example, viewership in both the United States and in Canada 
was down from the previous year and not in an insignificant way. And then you have this halftime show, which historically has been like, you know, filling, filling Carnegie Hall. I, you know, as far as items on a musical bucket list, this was one of them. And now you have artists who are having to, to defend themselves for even bothering to take part. So, I mean, at this point, is the NFL this kind of poisoned well, or, or is this just a one-year anomaly? The Super Bowl is uh, not just a game for Americans, right? It's associated with the concept of the American dream and community and freedom. So it's really kind of hypocritical to hear people who are saying just like, let us have our day, let us have this, you know, tradition. Um, they're often the people who are protected by privilege, not having to focus on these issues. Outrage is also cheap these days, right? I mean, in, in this particular era. Mm -hmm. And if you look at someone like Cardi B, who has said, I refuse to take part in the halftime show, and yet, I mean, she's, she's going to appear in a Pepsi ad for the Super Bowl. She's going to be playing in yeah. shows uh, in the run-up to the Super Bowl itself. Yeah. I do wonder if at the end of the day, the game is going to go on, the halftime show is going to go on, people are going to be outraged on Twitter and they're going to skewer Maroon 5, and then we'll all just kind of carry on. Yeah, it's interesting, and you mentioned Cardi B. If Maroon 5 plays the song that they have with her, she's going to benefit from those streaming numbers as well, even though she's waiting, you know, seven days to perform at the Grammys. I, I think the difference... It now, why we're not going to move on, is because it's not just fans, 100,000 signed a petition about this. It's other artists, other black artists, who said to Travis Scott, you shouldn't be performing with Adam Levine and Maroon 5. Jay-Z, um, Meek Mill, uh, the Reverend Al Sh Sharpton, Michael B. Jordan, people who aren't even musical artists, they're the ones speaking about it, and their fans are being engaged. I think that's why this is different. The, the question is, where do you draw the line, to your point? If you're in a Super Bowl commercial, is that a relationship with the NFL? Should Pepsi not sponsor the halftime show? How many people do we want to be mad at? I, I think that's the interesting thing to see. Here. Deshani, I'll give you the last word. I was going to say, you do have to draw the line. And in terms of Cardi B, like, I thought about this a lot. And I do think, like, the Pepsi ad is different because it's not directly benefiting the NFL. It's benefiting her and Pepsi. So she gets to get that money. And so I have, weirdly, no problem with that. But I do have a problem with people taking the halftime show and not considering these issues. Okay, guys, Super Bowl Sunday just around the corner. Thanks so much. The NFL isn't the only football league in the U.S. seeing a drop in numbers. Fewer parents are enrolling their kids in the sport. They're worried about concussion damage. Kim Brunhuber explores that on Sunday night. And get ready to play football. Do you understand? Football, says their coach Michael Wagner, is one of the last gladiator sports. But these days, he says, it's getting harder and harder to recruit new gladiators. You know, we're pariahs now as young, you know, football coaches. Ready, right, right, ready. Over the last 10 years in the U.S., participation in youth football has dropped more than 20%. Parents, Wagner says, have been scared off. According to some studies, these children will take an average of 250 hits to the head each season. And some parents are starting to worry that could damage their children's brains. Unfortunately, I think they've painted a false narrative that youth football is going to kill your kid. Watch for that on Sunday night. But up next on The National, giving patients with dementia the freedom to take risks. When you see the people that you live with, what do you think it is here that helps them have a good life? I think it's just people being kind to them and treating them like ordinary people, you know, like they're good people. A Toronto police officer will be charged with two counts of professional misconduct in connection with the case of serial killer Bruce MacArthur. Sergeant Paul Gauthier is set to appear at a tribunal on Tuesday for insubordination and neglect of duty under the Police Services Act. This week, MacArthur pleaded guilty to killing eight men over the course of seven years, many with ties to Toronto's gay village. These are the remnants of that recreation centre fire in Toronto that we told you about last night, still smouldering despite the freezing temperatures. Fire crews had to thaw out equipment and themselves in buses. It's believed to have started in the mechanical room. The work could continue into the weekend. And take a look at this surveillance video that shows a man trying to set fire or blow up a law office in Vaughan, Ontario, just north of Toronto. 
You can see the man grabs four gas cans, breaks the front door, then tosses them in, and then he lights it all on fire. It didn't take long for Cruz to put it out. Police say this happened back on January 7th, and they are looking for the suspect. Where are the cops at? But why is he on the wrong side of the road? This is wild. Terrified drivers in Nova Scotia had to swerve to avoid a car speeding the wrong way down a divided highway. This happened yesterday outside of Halifax. At one point, the car narrowly missing a tanker truck. The RCMP says the car did eventually crash into an SUV. The driver then stole a second vehicle, crashed again into a gas station. A 38-year-old man facing more than a dozen charges tonight. As Canada's population ages, caring for older relatives is an increasing responsibility, especially when it comes to those with dementia. Tonight, we're taking you inside a long-term care home with a novel approach. It's trying to strike a balance between safety and happiness, giving more choice and mobility to residents while accepting that comes with some added risks. As David Common found out, the people who live and work there think it's a good trade-off. For them, freedom is a fix to an aging concern. Getting exercise may seem to be the point, but at the Sherbrooke Care Home in Saskatoon, the real goal is a smile. Down the hall is Sylvia. She's off exercising her freedom. And for this dementia patient, that comes with risk. <laughs> oh, here we are. Amid the hugs with her nurse, May, a recognition that Sylvia is prone to falling, wears protective headgear, but isn't prevented from wandering. In some homes, they would just say, if you're at risk of falling. Yes. Oh, no, we let our residents live at risk. What does that mean, live at risk? Let them lead their life according to how they want to live. Like, we can't save them from injury, you know, but at least they're living their life. And being happy. Being happy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? <laughs> Let's play some music. Elsewhere, Sylvia might be locked down for her own safety, kept from walking far, possibly even sedated. Oh, yeah. Still Christmas here. Here, though, living a more fulfilling life is just as important as mitigating the risks. Well, you know what? I know the For the CEO, Sue Ellen Beatty, risk goes hand in hand with independence. Okay, you good? Traditionally, the, the philosophies that have been used in, in uh, long-term care have been kind of patriarchal, where we say we know what's best for you, and we really focus on the human body um, and make sure, you know, everybody's up and washed and dressed and fed and all of these things. But the bulk of suffering for people who are frail or disabled um, is really due to a, a malaise of the spirit, to the loneliness, the helplessness and the boredom. And yes, all those things for the, phys the body are important, but you can't neglect the human spirit. Our first red wine. Ultimately, that's about choice. <laughs> what to participate in. Yeah, that's a good idea. When to wake up, whether to go outside or not. That's probably a good idea. It is more restrictive in the neighborhoods where dementia residents live, but even then, it's there to allow for the greatest level of personal choice possible. Hi, Craig. When Sherbrooke was last renovated, most of the rooms became private and residents were allowed to bring in pets. She's a rescue from Los Angeles. There's quite a few now. No, no food. You have to wait. Elizabeth, who sees herself as an introvert, especially likes that Sherbrooke feels more like a home than many other long-term care facilities. What are the like little things that make it a home for you? Being able to decorate the room the way I want. <laughs> Having a cat. Most care homes, I don't think, love pets. And that makes us very special. Don't you take? This is bentonite. So this is one of the first chemicals we put in the wine. And all this done with an average budget. This is no millionaire's club. You like budgets? Sherbrooke has the same number of staff as many places of its size. It's salad and homemade pizza for lunch. Meal times can be small affairs, prepared in an ordinary kitchen for those who live right around it. Knock, knock, Winnie. Are you ready for some lunch? 
whether it be their meals or their daily activities, from getting up in the morning or going to bed at night. It's all about choices here at Sherbrooke. It is ready. Carrie Prodal works here. She's not moved around from floor to floor. These are her people. They know her. Coffee, maybe? She knows them. Or juice. And Carrie's worked in other homes, but never like this. Ready for your other one? Yeah. Okay, here we go. We came into the city and I never thought I'd find a place to work where it was so home-like, but Sherbrooke really has been that for me. It's, it's just, um, it's just a happy place to be. That doesn't mean it's problem free. Last year, this man with dementia wandered away and Sherbrooke acknowledges greater freedom comes with greater risks. I got a little bit of apple juice to help you. Some families complain about insufficient activities for dementia patients and resident on resident violence, a growing trouble for care homes nationwide remains an issue here. Do you feel that you're immune at all to some of the things that are experienced at other homes where resident on resident uh, violence in some cases or resident on staff violence? Do you have immunity to that here? No, absolutely we don't, but um, we do do something very specific to avoid that. Uh, we don't force people to do things they don't want to do. So imagine that you're confused, you have dementia, and I want to make you do something that you think is unsafe for you. You're probably going to fight me, right? Mm -hmm. Um, you're trying to protect yourself most of the time. And then the other thing is if we put you with somebody else who's confused as well, we, we could have an altercation. So it's not as if you have a utopia here. There are things that are lacking and wanting. Do you know, real life is not utopia. Like, and we're living real life here and it's hard. And, and if you can imagine people coming at a point in their lives where things have and sometimes fallen apart. Nobody wants to come to a care home, but what we have tried to do is say, you know, when you come, we're going to make, we're going to look for well-being for you. The next phase at Sherbrooke is in some ways being pioneered by residents like Alice. She chooses to live amongst those with dementia, but does not have the condition herself. When you see the people that you live with, what do you think it is here that helps them have a good life? I think it's just people being kind to them and treating them like ordinary people, you know, like they're good people. Everybody goes, roll out the While this approach to care isn't for everyone, for Sylvia, Alice, and Elizabeth, there is no place like this home. David Common, CBC News, Saskatoon. The moment is straight ahead on The National, but first we have an update on a story Rosemary just loves. Remember this? A mystery for the ages in Montreal. How did this snow bear really get its belly button? Well, you had no shortage of theories. Was it a stick? A drone, the favorite guest, aliens. Well, CBC Montreal found the woman behind it. She used five snowballs. So we kind of wrote off the, the snowball theory uh, because I thought, you know, you'd have to have a really good aim, especially we know she made it at night. So, um, but she tells me that she uh, just threw five snowballs individually and that created the belly button that is now uh, kind of internationally famous. So there you have it, mystery solved. And the key part in all this, our senior producer, Roger, was wrong. That's him. That's my father. Any idea who might have done this to him? Throw a stone in this town and you'll hit someone with a grudge against him. Joanna, anything you need, I'm here. We have to find who did this. Either he knew the killer let them in and unlocked the door, or the killer was already inside the room. I found new evidence. You broke into the crime scene? We think that they're going to charge you with manslaughter. You can't think she did this. I don't know what to think. A new episode of Burden of Truth, Wednesday at 8 on CBC. You are long overdue for some D. I'm like 6,000 kegels away from any kind of D. Then get squeezing.
In Judaism, a minion is a quorum of ten men required for certain religious obligations, like a burial. And it was Ephraim Ben Dov's last wish. The Holocaust survivor died this week in Toronto. The trouble is he lived alone and was pretty much unknown. But when his rabbi made a request on Facebook, well, Ephraim Ben Dov got that wish. And that is our moment of the day. A little Facebook my mind. When I saw that post on Facebook, I realized the, uh, the gravity of the situation. Here is a dying man, a dead man, a Holocaust survivor that needs to be buried. So I didn't think twice. I just left everything I did, left work, and, uh, and got there as soon as I could. None of you know who he is except for a brother and a nephew yeah. from a little small town I never heard of before. And all you people came. I got there. Uh, I, I saw a lot of total strangers, people that I did not know. He got the hug from the Jewish community of Toronto and um, from our Jewish heart. I do know some things about the Holocaust because my father is also a Holocaust survivor. I could not bear the thought of this man being buried alone. Sometimes you let a moment speak for itself. That is the National for February the 1st. Good night.